Hello, everybody. Welcome to the ICA. My name is Catherine Stout. I'm head of program here. I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. Uh, now you can go rescue missions, women's art recovered. Um, I'd like to welcome our panelists and particularly our chair, the art historian Amy Tobin, whose research is centered around feminist art in the 1970s um, for this evening's discussion. This discussion is part of Now You Can Go, which is a programme considering feminist thinking, art and activism, which has been taking place across several London venues throughout December this year. It grows out of uh, the Feminist Durational Reading Group, which meets monthly at Space Studios in London. The programme has been developed by participants from the Feminist Durational Reading Group, including Angelica Bolitanara, uh, Julia Casalini, Diana Giorgio, Laura Guy, Irene Ravel, Amy Tobin, who's of course our chair, and uh, is coordinated by Helena Rickett with Demetra Erksika. So thank you to Helena and Demetra. We're hugely thankful to all of the group for their work on this programme, and we are really delighted to be hosting this programme here at the ICA. So we have just over an hour for the panel discussion, and then there will be a chance for questions, but I ask you to just wait for the mic in order to ask your question. And so I hand over to Amy, our chair. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so welcome to Rescue Missions, Women Artists Recovered, Reenacted and Recuperated. So I'm delighted to welcome our panellists for this evening, Sonia Boyce, Lisa Panting, Valer Valeria Napoleoni and Lois Kaiden, and everyone in the audience as well. Before I introduce our speakers this evening, I just wanted to say something about the motivations for organising a panel on this theme and in the context of the Now You Can Go programme. Um, because despite the constant concern for women's histories and in feminist activism, the idea of rescue missions runs counter to what to much of the writing and activism of Italian feminists, in particular Carla Lonzi. Uh, and Carla Lonzi's book *Vipera* is where we get the title for our program, so it seems sort of relevant to make this point. Now the question for Lonzi was not so much about doing or not doing the work of recovery, but where we recover to. And in her article, Let's Spit on Hegel, Lonzi argued that women have been forced into a negative position in relation to men, a position that could only be broken by evacu evacuating the masculine-defined physical and intellectual spaces that constituted culture, society, and the law, and therefore that defined life. Indeed, women in many different contexts problematized a feminism based on equality and recuperation. Perhaps this was most concisely put by the art critic Lucy Lippard, though, when she commented um, with some exasperation on her own exhibition organizing. Um, uh, well, she asked the question, who, who wants a slice of this rotten pie anyway? And indeed, uh, for many writers, artists, and critics, feminism and women's art provided a route out of the museum, as well as other disciplines and discourses. Uh, in turn, these acts of trespass bent and muddied the linear progressive run of history, blurring greatness, objectivity, and rhetoric with failure, personal histories, folk tales, and dialects, among many other things. So in the 1970s and 1980s, though, this work started to transform some institutional settings, and including the ICA. And I just wanted to briefly show you some examples of feminist exhibitions to sort of make those histories present and to sort of uh, open the question of why we would have an event at the ICA in the first place. So this one is um, a feminist, though, a portrait of the artist as a housewife, which took place in 1977 here. And this sh showed work from a postal art event where women exchanged objects through the mail. They're all very sort of ratty and crafty. And then these are the front covers of the catalogues for the women's cycle, which happened here in 1980. Uh, this one issue was selected by Lucy Lippard. And then here's just a flavor of other events that happened um, around the time of the women's cycle. So you have two more exhibitions as well as a conference in addition to the ones at the ICA. And these are all archival images. And then one I particularly like, which is their own Salon de Refusé, because uh, women's images of men was open call. 
And despite being open call, there was lots of women who were left out and felt that they needed to have their own exhibition. And then this is just the justification for women's images of men happening at the ICA as well. Um, so I'll give you a second to have a look at this. And I think what's really crucial here is the idea of creating a continuing support system for women artists and how that can be done through institutions. And then finally, I'm just returning to this image of um, Monica Ross' Acts of Memory and um, with the WAC show, which has been a great propeller, I think, for feminist art histories anyway in the last few years. But to return to the problem of rescue missions, because the complex multiple histories that emerged from feminism in the 1970s, 80s and 90s are themselves in need of recuperation now. I wonder how many of you had heard of all of those shows before. Especially as the centres, spaces and collectives that feminists and other activists occupied, that, that other activists occupied have been all but washed away or just holding on against the tidal shifts of public funding and private investment. The question is, how do these historical pasts survive in the present for those who lived through it and for those who didn't? Or how do we listen to and capture a cacophony of voices, preserve difficult histories, talk about violence, and connect despite feelings of precarity, anxiety, and erasure? And these are important issues because they determine how these pasts and political struggles survive and reproduce in the present and the future. <coughs> histories of second wave feminism, like histories of women, queer, trans and black artists in the decades before and since, are in a continuously precarious position. The erasure of these histories is a form of political violence, keeping those excluded weak in relation to the dominant white, male and heterosexual order. In this way, a rescue mission is not simply about accruing value and recognition from particular museums, galleries and dealers, but concerns making this art and cultural production visible, as well as changing how art and culture are valued. It's not just about giving women trans, queer or black artists exhibitions, but about presenting work in those exhibitions in different and radical ways as well as providing security, protection, and routes of transmission for that work in the present and the future. These are continuing demands that are not resolved by crunching numbers and displaying Guerrilla Girls posters in major museums. Instead, they ask for pragmatism, imagination, and dedication to think about art and culture in radically different ways. And on that note, I want to introduce our speakers who have those qualities in excess. So first, we're going to hear from Sonia Boyce, who's an artist who first came to prominence in the 1980s as part of the black arts movement in Britain. Her large-scale chalk drawings featured in the 1983 exhibition Five Black Women at the Africa Centre in London. But since the 1990s, Sonia's multimedia practice has involved bringing people together to speak or sing about the past and the present. Recent exhibitions include Speaking in Tongues at the Centre for Contemporary Art in Glasgow and the film Exquisite Cacophony, which premiered at the 56th Venice Biennial in 2015. Her work is also in the Tate Collection. Sonia is Professor at Fine Art at Middlesex University and is also Principal Investigator for a research project, Black Artists and Modernism, based at the Train Research Centre at University of the Arts, London. Next, we'll hear from Lisa Panting. Lisa is co-director of Hollybush Gardens with Marlon Stahl. Hollybush, um, sorry, my notes are really small here. <laughs> so Hollybush Gardens opened in Bethnal Green in 2005 before moving to a bigger space in Clerkenwell in 2013. The gallery mixes the curatorial with the commercial and represents artists including Andrea Butner, Joanna Billing and Lubania Hamid who has curated the exhibition Carte de Visite, currently showing. Valeria Napoleone is an art collector who focuses on contemporary female artists and is a patron to art organisations including Studio Voltaire, for which she heads the development committee. She also sits on the boards of the Contemporary Art Society, the Fashion Arts Foundation of the BFC, the Institute of Fine Arts New York, and the NYU President's Global Council. 
In 2015, she launched Valeria Napoleoni XX in partnership with Contemporary Art Society and the Sculpture Centre in New York to continue her long-standing support of women artists. Finally, Lois Kaiden, who is the co-founder and co-director of the Live Art Development Agency in London. She has previously worked at the Institute of Contemporary Arts, the Arts Council of Great Britain, the Midland Group, and the Theatre Workshop. From 2013, the Live Art Development Agency has hosted the third iteration of their Restock, Reflect, Rethink series, uh, which focused on live art and feminism. And it was co-organised with Eleanor Roberts. Lois is also a friend of the Monica Russ Action Group, and it's Monica's work, Acts of Memory, a work about the transmission of politics and history across difference and distance that is featured on the publicity of, for this event and which you see here. So all the speakers um, are going to present one after the other, and then we're going to open up for discussion and questions from the audience. Um, so I'll hand over to Sonia. Um, actually, I, want to, I did want to start off by, um, of course, thanking thanking um, everybody here for for inviting me to, to speak um, on this panel. Very excited about this this whole series and particularly uh, tonight. Um, and I wanted to start off actually with talking a little bit about uh, Monica. Um, the reason I became an artist was because of uh, Phoenix Feminist Art Collective of which Monica was part of and I would always kind of be gushing when I would talk with her about you know how seeing seeing the work that they were doing completely changed my life um, so I just wanted to begin with that um, and also I suppose to also reflect on this question of memory and uh, reclamation which I suppose well, what I'm about to talk to you about today is um, is very much a part of uh, so the top bit a tiny bit so for some reason the title has disappeared um, from this slide, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, and the slide should say, um, and I've forgotten what the slide should say now, haven't I? Um, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Okay, so um, what I wanted to, uh, to uh, get us to kind of think about and hopefully talk a bit about is a project that I've been working on since 1999 called The Devotional Project. Um, it was a. It began as what. Or what was the initial intention was that it was going to be a six-month project, that would uh, would partner me and uh, a group in Liverpool, uh, Liverpool Black Sisters, uh, as part of Fact, which is the Foundation for Art and Creative Technology, their collaborations program. And the idea was that I would work with uh, with this particular group, and uh, we would do some research and uh, make and co-produce an artwork. And what I wanted the group to do was to, um, to do a kind of, to start to build a history of black British female singers. Um, and in our very, very se first session, and I'm sure there are probably people here who've heard me talk about the devotional project before, um, so they will know that in the very first uh, session that I, uh, I had with this group, um, I mentioned, okay, I, you know, can you name the first, can you name a black British singer? And it took us ten minutes before anyone could remember anybody, and so thus this project kind of began. Um, in terms of thinking, uh, we were given, we were sent uh, a series of, of, of essays uh, in order to kind of think about this panel discussion, and uh, there was a particular essay that I was. Uh, taken by called We Are All Clitoridian Women Notes on Carla Lonzi's Legacy. And one of, the, uh, one of the things that really struck me by this essay was uh, a moment where uh, Carla uh, almost falls out with her partner uh, and basically dismisses him by saying, you can go now. Uh, and it seemed in part that the, the reason for the rift between the two of them was around the question of work and uh, work and desire. And I, so I'm, part of me is kind of thinking about this question of women and work and the value of the work and the skills that they bring to, uh, to what they do, particularly as it pertains to, and I have the feeling that the, uh, whatever, I don't, whatever the change has been to this PowerPoint is, is supposed to actually work automatically, um, that, um, that oh, it's all right, I will do it. Um, 
that the question of skill and sound as it pertains to this particular project is uh, one that uh, often leaves women that work in this field in a very, very precarious position. So what we did basically with the, with the project was uh, people then went around and started asking friends and colleagues, because we all felt quite embarrassed by our lack of memory of any uh, performers. And uh, what then started to happen was that people then started to bring back names to the group and we started to build a kind of collective memory. And, and out of this project, and it began in 1999, as I said, and it was supposed to last for about six months, but people have continued to send me names and to send me um, records and a variety of material which is now built into a kind of collection and archive. And, and what has been happening with this collection and archive is that I've been um, dipping into it to, in order to make artworks. And in some of the instances, I have been um, working and, and hopefully we'll will come to uh, a particular um, artist who's here in the audience of works where I've invited people to come and work with me on the material. But I suppose one of the things that I'm really particularly um, interested in in terms of this project, uh, Ayeen, who um, I worked with on a, a film that I'm not sure if it's still showing at the Whitechapel, whether that's closed, I think it might have closed now, but it's been shown recently, and this work has seems to have travelled quite a bit. This was a collaboration on one of the one of the performers that is uh, is featured in, in the archive in the collection called Adelaide Hall. I don't know if anybody here knows of Adelaide knew of her work. But I'm really concerned and quite interested by the way in which sound in many ways is retained in the memory, yet the performers themselves somehow disappear. Um, and for me, there's a kind of allegory, you might say, or a, a kind of counterpoint between what happens in the music industry, but also what happens in the visual arts. That, you know, if one is to think about the, the black arts movement of the 1980s, many, many, many of the artists that were showing there were women, and one hardly sees any of them anymore. So for me, there are many comparisons between um, what has happened in terms of the music industry and what has been happening in terms of uh, the visual arts. Um, so I've got here, there's about, there's over, there's about 60 slides here. It was meant to all happen very elegantly. Um, but never mind, never mind. Um, I, yeah, sure. Um, so I suppose one of the things that um, is really, uh, has been really interesting about how this project has evolved is that it's, it's been very much word of mouth. I mean, lots of people will send me stuff because they know somebody who knows, who knows somebody who knows me and they'll send information to me. So when I talk about it being kind of a collective form of, of memorializing, it really has been. Um, at the end of the six-month project, there were 40 names. I now have over 350 names, artists that date back to the mid-19th century to the present day. So it's constantly on the move. Um, I think I would really just like to whiz through all of these so that people can kind of... Uh, and actually, the slides that I've got here are, I've only done from A to, a to C, and there are many, many, many more. And as I say, these, this, is a, this is a work, uh, this was me showing the work in another format at the CCA in Glasgow. Um, um, and as I say, I keep dipping into the archive and uh, making new works, sometimes with others and sometimes on my own. Uh, we're almost going to... So I'm clicking through quite quickly. And there may be names that you know, and the hope is, of course, that it activates, not only is it in terms of its building, but in its reception, that it activates memory, activates um, people talking again about uh, the nature of how these performers um, and uh, women who work in this industry have somehow been parts of our lives, even, even if we don't like the work. You know, they have, you know, that's the point about sound, is that it's, it, it enters us all and we all retain um, various forms of memory uh, and I think I'm there.
Is this? Yeah, this is my mic. Um, I also just have to acknowledge Monica, actually, um, as her image was the introductory image to this event, um, because Monica is also somebody that was, funnily enough, very important to me um, as, as a, a young curator and somebody that was running a not-for-profit space in London um, in the 90s. So it's very interesting that these kind of events are hopefully going to maybe join some of those dots and um, maybe finally we'll start to kind of record those histories. Um, and unfortunately, she's no longer here with us, but um, yeah, this, this talk can maybe be dedicated to her. So um, I'm a gallerist, and um, some of you, most of you might know what that means. Um, <laughs> you might think you know what that means, um, and you might have very strong opinions about what that means. And um, I'm just going to try and um, unpick some of that for you, but more importantly, maybe unpick some of the things that we actually do, and um, that we do to not just counter um, the notion of the market, whatever that may be, but actually to um, describe and tell you a bit about some of the things we do, not because we are, um, I don't really know how to describe this, not because we are, um, no, I'm going to say this the other way around, not because we are overtly trying to sell work, but because we are trying to defend the work that we represent, if that somehow makes sense. So um, I, was, I just was going to start with this opening slide to our um, website, which is a very kind of um, boring looking website, and you have to click on uh, names to, to get images and information. But one of the things that comes and happens to us often is that we... Um, get loads of comments from curators and peers and collectors and everyone sort of involved in, in the art world. Um, and the assumption is that we only work with women. Um, and that, that to me is really interesting because if you actually look at the list of artists that are up there, um, maybe percentage-wise we work with 65% women. So what that means is that that list to the world screams, you only work with women. Um, and actually, if you, if you do research, and I've looked at this quite a lot, and there are artists that have done lots of this kind of research, um, there are lots, and in fact, the majority of galleries representing artists in the world today do not represent an equal number of women as they represent men. But I can guarantee you that no gallery that represents 90% men is kind of accused of only being a man's gallery. So there's a complete sort of imbalance um, there. So why is it that women are underrepresented? Um, and I'm sure you all know your art history and your art theory, and we, we, we know what the structural reasons are for that um, underrepresentation. Um, but I think still, and you know, we're sort of faced with this often in a very kind of um, straightforward way, is that male artists are assumed to have more gravitas and to have more um, cultural value. Um, I was recently in Chicago and I was talking about an artist we work with who's 60 and I think it's very interesting, and they just said to me straightforwardly, I'm sorry, but we will not collect a woman who is 60 because she will not accrue in value. You know, end of story. And you can't believe that we're in 2015, but these kind of um, anecdotes happen all the time in the world that, you know, I occupy, sadly. Um, and I was going to make a point about the relationship between the market and the museum as well, that there's a sort of tacit set of relationships which, you know, we perhaps know about um, and we think about, but are actually very, very um, dominant, and especially in um, a world where, you know, as, as you've pointed out, funding is sort of leaving the public sector at an alarming rate, and therefore the relationships that, you, you know, curators and museums can create with private capital mean that private capital is entering into, you know, the institutional realm, um, which means that 
the artists that are kind of mostly dominant um, are, are sort of appearing there still um, and overrepresented. So um, I'm going to just talk briefly to some slides um, that I've put together from artists that we actually work with and just try and show some examples that might bring out things that we want to talk about and address. Um, so all the slides I've, sh I've chosen, because I tried to think of a logic, but there wasn't really one, so I've just um, picked a few works that um, operate within a set sort of time frame. So works that we've been dealing with, or shows that we've been dealing with in the last year. And um, this is a work by Lubaina Himid um, called A Fashionable Marriage. And um, it was first shown in the 1980s, um, but here it's on show, um, remade, um, especially for an exhibition called Keywords at Tate Liverpool. Um, and what's quite fascinating about it, I think, apart from, you know, uh, that it's an incredible installation, actually you don't really get a sense of the scale of it from, from this slide, is that um, it's a satire, and I'm sure you all know about Hogarth, but actually if you sort of unpick some of the relationships that are happening in this image, you know, perhaps what we thought was happening in the 80s is actually still happening today. So, you know, it's um, this sort of insidious relationships between critics and artists is, is still something to sort of think about. I wanted to show this image um, because this is from um, a piece of work that we were really excited to show in the summer as part of a program of events um, under the heading studio. Um, and this is a work by um, Seth Talentire, and it's called Trailer. And this is just a sort of partial installation view of a, of a bigger installation, um, which we staged for the for the evening only, and um, we wanted to show this because it said something really interesting about um, the, a discussion around sight, performance, and, and the city, and um, this was made in Dublin in 1999. Um, obviously, we're having, we're sort of readdressing those discussions about uh, sight and the city, and the city as a contested space, um, and increasingly, obviously, in London, that, that, that kind of discussion is coming to the fore. Um, this is another piece by Lubaina Himid that we showed in the gallery in a group show called If a Circle Meets Itself. And this is a work where she's looked at uh, the Guardian newspaper, and she's tried to sort of look at how race is represented in the newspaper over a very long time. And this is an excerpt from the, an ongoing series where she's looked at how the paper have chosen to represent um, black women um, and if you if you look at it very carefully, you can't quite believe some of the images, uh, some of the relationships that are created between advertising and uh, photographs of of uh, black people like Maya Angelou next to a spade, I think, uh, um, and black vodka next to Selena Williams. I mean, you sort of wonder who's sort of making these choices in these in these newspapers. Um, and I suppose more shocking because it's not the Daily Mail, it's the Guardian, and we assume that you know this this paper might um, know better. Um, <coughs> this is a uh, installation view of a video installation by Johanna Billing, who is someone who's very uh, important to the gallery. She's actually the reason we started the gallery in the first place in 2005, and um, I wanted to sort of just bring her up because she's somebody who's had a very, what you would call outwardly a successful career, but she made the mistake of going off and having children. And um, this is something that it's very, very difficult for women, female artists to recover from within the kind of commercial gallery context. And it's taken a lot um, of effort and support to, to sort of try and maintain her position um, in the in the kind of not just discourse but within the sort of institutional realm um, oh okay um, this is a work by Lena McGeorge just very quickly but I wanted to show this just because it's actually a, a physical translation of data about the representation of female and male artists within Norwegian art collections um, and then I will just end here because this is in our current show at the moment, and it's a, 
absolutely fantastic work by Claudette Johnson, who hasn't shown since um, 1990, I think. So. No. <laughs> I start first. Uh, hi, I'm Valeria Napoleone. I'm a collector um, and I'm a patron, whatever it means nowadays to be a patron, but I do it my own way anyway. Uh, I've been collecting since the 1990s and um, only women artists in my collection. Um, it's about great artists, it's not about uh, um, lending a hand to these poor women who cannot make it otherwise. So, uh, in the past, uh, I, in the past, uh, well, 18 years, I, I met incredible people, women like Lisa and and Malin, and um, and recently, in the past uh, few months, I launched a new initiative called XX. Um, XX stands for female chromosome and uh, its collaborations as well. Collaborations with institutions and, uh, and artists around spaces and uh, artists, collectors, other collectors, curators. Uh, but mainly it just launched with two initiatives, one in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the UK, the Contemporary Art Society, and one in New York, the Sculpture Center. I, I was born a collector in New York, and for me, has a special meaning. And I wanted also to take it uh, in, in a place where di different dynamics and different uh, ideas uh, and, and uh, directions are born. So XX uh, wants to, to uh, you know, push people into looking at things uh, and looking at situations about women artists, under underrepresentation, discriminations. It's not an attempt to fill any gaps, uh, especially with the contemporary society when we donate a work each year to a regional museum. The gaps are huge and it cannot be filled. But it's, a, it's an attempt to uh, to corner the curators or the director and uh, and make them look into their their reality and see what's missing, uh, which is obviously you know uh, just it doesn't need an introduction. Uh, in terms of uh, the sculpture center. Um, uh, XX funds uh, every year or so uh, just a major installation by a, an artist in the context of this artist's show at the Sculpture Center. And so it's a, it's an, a woman artist, and it's about uh, linking uh, XX with this major installation. It's about experimentation. It's about giving artists um, the, the opportunity to do something outside the commercial reality. And um, this is a, a normal development of what I've been doing for the past 18 years, uh, but it's more and more um, stepping into a different reality, which is uh, um, critical, analytical discourse and, uh, and, um, and look into artist practices and steering uh, conversations uh, um, in, among, you know, among artists or among people, professionals, about art practice, art production. Um, I have uh, brought something. I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here because it's so necessary, and uh, and I have the chance to uh, to say something that is, you know, uh, it's so necessary to necessary to, uh, to create this network of connection, of discourse, of dialogue, dialogue and discussion uh, that's lacking among women. Uh, there are incredible women, globally speaking, uh, who are committed to what they do, but isolation is really, uh, and, and disconnection, you know, it's, it's really present. Uh, so um, I've been talking and I've been supporting some work of Fatima Holberg, he's a, he's, he's a great uh, young uh, curator, so he's become director of the concert house in uh, Stuttgart. And, um, and Fatima just came to me uh, the other day. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> can you do this? <laughs> came to me the other day after, you know, we've been uh, talking and discussing the situation um, and said, Valeria, really, I think this is missing. I want to uh, do a project with you and, and, uh, and, and I, you know, we are not, I, I'm not ready to talk about this project, but it's, uh, the core is, um, 
this network and the core is discussion about uh, from the artist's point of view uh, on their practices, on what motivates them and uh, on their, their dynamics, uh, on their sensitivity. Um, there is too much nowadays about you know the stick in the box i've done the women's artist show and now i'm politically correct and let's move on and you touch that and and uh, i mean sorry but this doesn't make it i mean it's great we are grateful that these women artists are ex exposed exhibited but that is not enough i mean there is something very uh, core that needs to be done and it's readdressing the fibers of this society which has been created by male, driven by male and uh, and so uh, we don't want to be accessory on, on a man's suit so and this what's gonna end if artists don't uh, uh, don't address this in a different way if you don't address what it means to be an artist, an artist, what it means, art production, what it means to be radical, do we need to be radical to be successful, what is success, because for women it's different than for men. And um, so I think this is really core uh, to, put, um, to put women in the fiber of society and uh, in the fiber of, of the art, uh, the art um, system. Um, I can read something, I want to read something because Fatima, uh, she is, you know, she is based in Stuttgart now, and and I think it's uh, this is maybe one of the few first uh, connection that I'm establishing internationally, um, and and uh, you know stressing the importance of having this network among among women among people interested in this. So sorry, I don't want to lose you, but it's it's necessary. Um, to speak of rediscovery follows a logic that has little to do with the temporality, rhythm, or condition of uh, artistic practice. To move beyond the finding and adding impulse, we need to consider other ways of engaging where we take our time and stay put, not merely in the dedication to the work, but in the, uh, in the commitment to and the care of the practice. There is an urgent need for giving space to the sharp, witted, critical, funny, and absolutely necessary way in which female artists have formulated the logic of their work. The question of having a room in, of one's own still applies, and the strategies and ways of living, working, and thinking uh, that female artists have formulated offer perspectives and experiences rarely considered in contemporary art history. It is within this mode of commitment and attention that we start talking about materiality and making, but also our friendship and pleasure in ways that are more than extensions of the artwork, but in fact are integral part of its being. It is too simple to merely add to an existing structure of how contemporary art is conceived and narrated, a structure still largely dominated by a legacy of man. Instead, more is needed to introduce questions mark into its logic and ways of doing. What has more profound and fundamental potential requires a deeper level of commitment, not merely to an artwork, a name, or a position, but to the specific knowledge and experience sh uh, she has produced and actively produces through her work. I think the main point is, uh, is really one of giving a voice to this other logic that we simply do not give space for, one which does not merely have to do with adding more, consuming more, showing more. I also think it, it might be interesting to mention something about the fact that there tends to be a clear space for women when they represent a, f a fresh perspective by virtue of youth or a historical perspective by virtue of age, but that we struggle with the actual woman artist between 35 and 65, and that's true. And this is Fatima's work. Thanks, Amy, and thanks very much uh, for inviting me to part of this panel. I'm, I'm coming from a slightly different place, because um, I'm talking about, um, I work in performance art, live art, um, and um, 
if you think issues of exclusion are bad in the visual arts, um, <laughs> just see what happens in live art. I mean, partly because of its sort of itinerant, ephemeral, interdisciplinary nature, lack of documentation, sort of not uh, lack of sort of critical discourses. Live art has sort of tended to be uh, marginalised from most sort of cultural cultural histories anyway. Um, and so, in 2006, we started this initiative called Restock, Rethink, Reflect, which is sort of um, aims to sort of map and mark significant artists and practices uh, that have been underrepresented and excluded from both official cultural histories and, and within the histories of live art itself, and to try and write them back into public awareness whilst also trying to invest in future generations through specialised resources and artistic development initiatives, partly so that future generations don't need to deal, don't have to uh, sort of have the levels of exclusion that we've sort of been touching on tonight. Um, previous iterations of this project have been on um, race, 2006-2008, um, and on disability, 2009 to 2011. And in 2013, we started on um, RRR3 on live art and feminism, which was looking at the impact of performance on feminist histories, and vice versa, actually. And particularly the work of artists who might otherwise be forgotten, lost, not known about in the first place, or have been written out of cultural history. And the projects involved all kinds of collaborations with all kinds of artists of all ages through um, and generated publications, public programs, resources, um, and archival projects. And I'm just going to sort of uh, romp through um, some of this is the page on our website that sort of maps all the things we've done in the last couple of years around this. And I think it sort of very much sort of touches on um, what, what this sort of um, this overall project is about, about sort of trying to rescue. Uh, trying to sort of rescue histories. Um, I just sort of wanted to touch on some of the sort of the key issues um, that the programme was trying to address really in terms of um, the sort of particular issues facing uh, the histories of, of uh, women in, in performance and some of the activities and strategies that we undertook to address them. So questions of exclusion from cultural histories and, and, and particularly questions of invisibility and particularly for older women artists. So we did a number of different kind of initiatives um, ar ar around that and all of these things sort of cross over with each other but um, we've kind of uh, generated sort of uh, resources in our, in our study room library. Um, so we've worked on a sort of Google Open Gallery which I'll come to in a second and various programs, certainly a program we just did two weekends ago called um, Old Dears which was on sort of the sort of fiercely feminist practices of an older generation of women artists. All of the artists in that program are were 50 years old and sort of could put most sort of first wave, uh, fourth wave feminists to shame with their sort of radical um, approaches. Um, questions of sort of intergenerational dialogues have been a really important aspect of that. The sort of this kind of keen, um, I mean, partly because of technologies, partly because of, of the kind of the platforms that there are now to sort of to, re to research and to map histories. This, this extraordinary sort of um, awareness of, of fourth wave feminists, of the sort of, of the first wave feminists, of artists who've gone before them, and this a real awareness and a real sort of appetite to engage in dialogues with them. And similarly, um, with the sort of first wave generation of, of, of feminist artists, um, they're really interested in who's kind of following in their footsteps, who's keeping the flame alive. And so we've been sort of supporting or trying to sort of instigate lots of different ways that those kind of generations can collaborate through sort of mentoring schemes, but through sort of programming programming um, kind of partnerships and opportunities to come together through discourse, which has been another really important aspect of the project, running in a whole number of sort of different kind of opportunities for discourse. Lois Weaver, the artist and scholar, who's been our, one of our main partners on this project, she has a, a project called The Long Table, which is literally a long table that anybody can sort of come to and speak at. And so we've organised quite a few of those. This whole project actually began with a long table, which, which we, we thought about 10 people would come to and about 160 kind of first wave, second wave, third wave and fourth wave feminists came and um, generated a whole bunch of really kind of great um, dialogues and uh, initiatives we were able to sort of take forward. Support for artistic practice itself and to sort of development of new methodologies has been cr kind of critical to this project, not just supporting sort of younger generation of artists, but also a sort of older generation artists as well. So we've just run a, a workshop with the, um, the Mexican performance artist Rocio Bolivar, who's probably one of the most kind of fearless um, and radical body artists working in the world today. And she just ran a, a week-long workshop for um, artists over 45. And I think all of the participants were over 50. And they sort of created a kind of collaborative work together. And again, it was just one of the most sort of fearless um, and awesome 
uh, sort of projects that many of us have sort of seen seen for a while. One of the participating artists was Sarah Kent, who used to be the visual arts editor at Time Out, who never wrote about performance art, and there she was, <laughs> cutting the clothes off her collaborator in homage to Yoko Ono. Um, but... Um, but also, um, as well as sort of opportunities for artists to have engaged with discourses around and with each other, there's also sort of opportunities for, we've tried to kind of support lots of different opportunities for audiences to engage with different ways into what a feminist practice can be, who a feminist practitioner might be, including issues of age. So we've just, we've done a number of programmes. There was the Old Ears programme, which was the, the work with older women artists, but we've just also done a programme called um, just like a woman, which is on the sort of performance of gender and the way sort of femininity can be performed, with sort of women performing as women, women performing men, men performing women, and, and then artists like David Hoyle who go beyond gender altogether. Um, and that was a sort of, again, a, a programme that sort of brought different sort of generations of artists um, together and, and sort of different artistic practices together. But the main things I just wanted to sort of touch on um, in relation to this evening's discussion is about um, the way that we've tried to generate um, um, resources, um, including sort of pu public, kind of uh, uh, provide access to a whole bunch of different kinds of resources, including publications and um, resources in our in our uh, research library, the study room. So we work with uh, Lois Weaver. Uh, well, actually, the first thing I should say is we were um, delighted to be the um, partners, um, the co-publishers of this extraordinary publication called React Feminism. React Feminism was a uh, two or three year project that um, traveled uh, around uh, Europe. It was a sort of, it was a project looking at, particularly at feminist artists from the from Eastern Europe and from South America, particularly artists from the 60s and 70s, artists who have absolutely been forgotten about. I mean, artists who, when they were contacted for this exhibition, sort of expressed surprise that anybody would be interested in, the, in their work, or that anybody had even heard of them in the first place. Um, and this, the, the exhibition sort of toured around Europe for, for several years and then generated this amazing publication which we were really thrilled to be the co-publishers of. And I do encourage everybody to look at the React Feminism website as well. I encourage everybody to buy the book, but also encourage everybody to look at the React Feminism uh, uh, website because it really is the most incredible, uh, incredible resource. And I don't know how to go back on here, so I'll go. But... Oh, right, thanks. Jeez. Um, but another... Um, a uh, publication that we've that we've done um, is um, we work with I say with Lois Weaver, and on a sort of digital sort of mapping dialogue project, um, but really looking at the kind of resources that we should be housing in our study room um, archive, um, and so it's a way of sort of a research project for us to build up the resources, but a way of sort of involving lots of different people in this sort of process about who, who who's who's been left out of history and how do we write them in, and that generated this. Um, this guide, study room guide called Are We There Yet? Um, which is a sort of fanzine, but it's also a website. And again, I would sort of encourage people to go to that, uh, to that website where it's sort of, um, it talks about a whole bunch of sort of issues related to this. Um, a series of artists created sort of maps of their own journeys through a feminist practice, citing the, the artists and the influences on their, on their own work. Um, we also did, um, uh, we did a, 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 a Wikimedia session, um, where we work with the, with the Wikipedia Foundation to a sort of day inviting people to kind of come in and create Wikipedia pages for, um, for feminist artists um, or to up, certainly update the pages for the artists that were on there and who you could count on one hand. Um, that was a fantastic day because the Wikimedia Foundation is run by sort of kind of bearded, hairy men. And um, it was a, a real kind of culture clash um, and issues about what kind of work has provenance and what kind of work is, can legitimately be on Wikipedia. So that's a sort of ongoing project. And the final thing I just very, very briefly want to mention is something that was just launched last week, um, which is the, um, blah, 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 um, this, which is um, it's part of the Google Cultural Institute. And um, they invited us to do um, an open gallery for, for them. And so we did this project on um, live art and feminism in the UK. Um, and it's just a sort of, um, it's a, got a sort of um, a, an essay by um, Ellie Roberts, who's doing a, who's a feminist scholar, who's doing a PhD at Queen Mary. And then we work with a whole bunch of different artists to sort of generate uh, images uh, to sort of people populate the um, gallery. So there's more information. I do encourage you to sort of check out React Feminism, to check out the print and online version of Are We There Yet? 
and um, this Google Open Gallery. And there's more information about all of those things um, on our website, um, but also in this sort of newspaper. Um, so if anybody wants copies of that, very happy to give them. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. That was great. And I'm feeling very G'd up now for discussion. Um, so I think I'll probably open it out just to see, because we don't have all that much time, and I think it'd be nice um, if anyone has any questions. Raise your hands. There's going to be a roving mic coming round. Yeah, please wait for the mic every time. <laughs> Hi, I have a question for Lisa with regards to reviving a career after motherhood. And I'm just wondering about the... Um, about the practical, I'm here. Oh, hi. I'm, I'm wondering, um, you talked about trying to support your artist who had, had made the mistake, effectively, of going off to have a child. Mm -hmm. Not that I think that's your opinion, but we know that that happens when they have Sorry. children. What, what was the last bit? You, your artist who had a child yeah. and trying to support her career after that. Yeah. For you, what does that entail to sort of... I suppose what I'm saying is you're trying to appease her collectors and reassure them that she is worth collecting. Um, actually, it runs deeper than that. It's not about appeasing her collectors. It's about um, showing that she's relevant to curators and institutions. That's actually more the problem, to be honest. Um, it's not about yeah, collectors at all. Um, so, in, in fact, she had two children, so she was away for, I mean, away, you know off, not so present, not able to travel as much um, for maybe four years. Um, so, yeah, it's about that, trying to reconnect and, and maintain people's interest simply. So I suppose our role there is to kind of continually stage her work when, whenever we can and to sort of try and keep that conversation going and get, you know, reviews and that kind of thing and get responses to the work. Other questions? Anyone? Okay, well, I guess I get to jump in then. Um, also, I guess one thing that struck me about everyone's uh, contributions was about kind of um, speed or time or age. And these are all kind of things that I constantly am coming up against in research because I feel like I'm constantly tra chasing paper trails to try and sort of find any kind of evidence or, or any kind of information about things that sort of happened only 35 years ago, you know, and, and it's when you sort of find out that an artist has a whole catalogue that you're sort of like jumping for joy in this kind of strange way that seems very, un well, it's incredibly uneven in relation to the um, immense amount of matter and materials that um, are associated with other people. And um, I just wondered really what, what your sort of approaches would be to this because I was struck by what you said about it not being a sense of adding, constantly adding more, having more exhibitions, finding more women artists. And I guess there is a logic as well to like not just sort of adding more women to the rosters of galleries but kind of changing the way galleries work. And I just wondered if you had reflections on this in regard to the kind of legacies um, as well as the kind of... New. <laughs> well, I think, again, I mean, um, I think you just sort of have to look to te technology because in all kinds of ways, and ironically for sort of an area of practice that's all about the live, um, technology has just made all of the difference. But I think for all kinds of reasons, technology has made a difference to representation of underrepresented um, artists and issues because technologies sort of, and particularly online platforms, have allowed us to bypass the gatekeepers of culture in all kinds of ways. So you're not necessarily dependent on um, the main um, official publishers to publish. Anybody can now publish. Anybody can get anything online. And it's just made an absolute huge, huge difference um, in, to the sort of visibility and also kind of capacity to research what's out there. So I think the more stuff that can be sort of got online um, the, the, the bigger the difference that, that, that that's going to make for visibility and for representation. So, I mean, one of the things about that, one of the reasons we started this whole Restock Rethink Reflect 
project and was was because the amount of times we heard the kind of things that Lisa sort of examples, you know, and the amount of uh, sort of curators that say they, they, they would work with more black artists, but they don't know any. And so we sort of produced a bunch of resources that we could slap on their desks and say, well, there you go. Here's a bunch to start with and uh, come back to us when you want more, more names. Um, and, uh, and it's that. It's about, it's about sort of levels of visibility. And I do, as I say, I think, on, uh, I think sort of online um, platforms are just such a sort of obvious place to increase visibility. Um, part of me is also thinking about not, I mean, of course, the question of visibility is in, in a very complex and very important question, but there's also the question about um, critical cultural response and how we engage with not only the practices of the past, but the practices that are happening now. You know, I'm, I'm a bit wary that we're, we're, we're talking only in terms of legacy, but not actually well, what kinds of conversations do we want to be having now about the work either made however long ago or the work that's being made now. It's that space, that space of response that I think is really um, urgently, urgently uh, required. And of course, it speaks volumes that this room's full, you know, that we need to be having those dialogues. Um, yes, it's not about adding more or showing more and making, uh, you know, making oneself feel good about it. Uh, it's really entering at a deeper level and establishing connection, establishing support, and especially uh, making people understand what uh, is, you know, what is a, a practice what is practiced by a woman and what are the di different dynamics um, and, and different uh, ideas uh, that, that drive, you know, drives that. So it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a game against against time, against the fast, uh, you know, against all the logic that has been driven the art market, the art world forever, because it's been set up by male and by men, and it's uh, it's about fast, fast production, fast return, fast everything, and so it's a it's a game against time, and it's a war against time, and and women when they they become pregnant, they have children, and um, they go against that, and and that you know. Know, they're not able to be engaged so much. And that is uh, really making people understand that an artist, a good practice is built in decades. It's not built in, uh, in two years, three years, or five years. Um, you need time to produce great work. You need time to collect and, produ uh, and create a great collection. You need time to create a great program as a curator. And, um, and also what against what, I mean, we are up against a lot of things, but also in terms of the, the museum world, I mean, um, there is, you know, this, uh, this fascination about youth, about uh, another novelty, and, um, and, uh, and fast, uh, you know, and, and also a popularity that is not, uh, is, is intact in curators, directors of museums, and as much as we want to think about uh, you know, being idealistic, uh, there are incredible in, in in, uh, people with in incredible integrity, but there are also people who are really, you know, lured away by, you know, by this uh, fast, uh, fast moving society, fast reward. Uh, and, and so this is about making people think in another way. This is why a lot of uh, it's, it's important to have to establish this discourse and this, and this critical thinking, analytical thinking, slow down time. But I think it's also really important that we like just like enjoy the work <laughs> as well. Like I mean, you need to have time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I really I think it, one thing is that often the work that gets picked up by women artists is often, or even when it's not, um, but the work that gets picked up by artists is a sort of always about like loss or melancholy or like the the sadness of being a woman artist in some way, or it's written about in that way, you know, because there's always this great melancholy around um, or worry about loss. And actually, a lot of the work that I've looked at for my research, but also that you see in many sort of art galleries, go way beyond that kind of framing. And, and there's a lot of jouissance or like kind of happiness and celebration of motherhood or domestic environments or any other of the, of the things that society might want us to deem like limiting. And I just think, um, yeah, that's something that kind of 
often gets lost in the kind of critical discourse that surrounds things like the rhetoric of rescue missions or recuperation or things like that? Well, there is a fine line between rescuing someone who just uh, needs to be rescued or uh, or just um, uh, you know activating something that is there, and so uh, people always come to me and say, "Oh, Valeria, so huh, your collection doesn't look like a collection by women artists," and you know, I mean, what do you answer to something like this? Or um, you know, poor these poor women, they they couldn't make it. I mean, there are incredible artists, and they will make it. It's just gonna take them longer time. But the thing is that we need to activate uh, these different mentality and different uh, different dynamic uh, and making people understand what is about you know um, this different direction we are all part of the same board and the art history the injustice of art history in, uh, in neglecting women it, it cannot go on any longer um, and nowadays, I agree with you, yes, it's looking backward, but it's looking forward. I mean, I, with my artists, I always look forward. It's about celebrating what it means to be a woman, what it means to be an artist, what it means to produce art by an artist nowadays. It's celebratory, it's not, uh, it's not uh, fighting against something, it's fighting for something and putting that on the plate. Um, and uh, yeah, it's forward thinking, definitely. I mean, we don't have to forget, uh, but we we need to look ahead and establish new dynamics. I'm, I'm kind of curious about this question of um, uh, uh, positioning women artists in a particular way. Um, I'm, I'm, in a way, I want to take up something that, that Lois said about uh, uh, feminist performance and how feminist performance may have changed performance. And so, I, you know, in a way, this is part of what I'm saying about a kind of critical space for responding to the work across the various aspects of this field. Because uh, I also want to say something about the idea of woman, woman artist, and mother, and um, worry that we all that we leap to that so quickly. Not, and I'm I'm an artist who is a mother at the same time. But I think that they don't always have to be coupled in terms of a history of women that have been involved in the visual arts. You know, I think that, that there have been many, a variety of positions. And actually, if I go back to when I was um, referring to the essay about Carla Lonzi, where this question about work and its value and whether one is, one, whether one is a careerist or not, you know, I would say that I am, you know, I'm obsessed by work. I'm always working. It may take many um, uh, directions, but it seems almost impossible to talk about woman as uh, 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 who is deeply committed to uh, to work and the value of that. Uh, and I, for me, I think that there is a real there are a lot of issues here that we might need to unpack. Um, I think that's that's really uh, true. And one person I didn't mention because I had to sort of whip through was um, an artist that we work with called Falco Pisano and. Um, I was just with her in Berlin yesterday and we were talking about the fact that her work is actually, um, she's an intellectual artist and she writes theory and she, and her work sort of is situated in a space between theory, um, sculpture, um, and it's incredibly complex. But because of its complexity, it's also um, been very problematic in terms of its modes of reception. I think, and I, I do think, and we were talking about this because I told her that I'd be here today, that um, Liam Gillick, plenty of other male artists who operate in the same sphere as she does, actually do not face the same problems that she's had, the same kind of crit uh, critical belittlement that she's had, the critical belittlement because she's not old enough to make the statements or have the ideas that she's had. Um, and I think that this is something that's that's still kind of quite sort of pervasive in the context. Um, so that's one kind of trope and one narrative. You've got motherhood, you've got several others, but you know, there's a way, a continual kind of way of pigeonholing people, I think, or, or especially sort of women artists that's you know, incredibly problematic. Um, and they sort of somehow become reduced by a, by a kind of identity, um, which is something that needs to be sort of dealt with. I just wanted to just chip in on that, just in this, use of the word sort of rescue 
and the sort of suggestion that this is kind of like rescuing some sort of kind of damsels, or damsels in distress or something. So, sort of poor women artists as these kind of victims and stuff. For me, the, the use of the word rescue in there is about rescuing art history. It's making sure that art history and audiences have got access to some of the most sort of, um, you know, exciting, radical, funny, um, uh, uh, profound, provocative um, pieces of art made by um, some of the most sort of awesome, uh, aw awesome artists. So it's not about sort of, it's not about victims in, 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 in that sense. It's about sort of restitution and making sure that our kind of cultural histories are representative of the full um, landscape of, um, of, of, of artists. Sorry. Questions, anyone? Oh my gosh. Hi, um, just uh, was kind of thinking about um, a lot of the things that you've been talking about, about the, the kind of, I'm interested in the, um, the how rather than the what and those spaces where we can uh, really think differently and where, where very different structures can be in play. And I'd be curious to hear from any of you really about um, uh, spaces of solidarity was how I wanted to put it. But also thinking about this not just as a historical thing, but as something that we're really confronting. But I'd love to hear any examples of places or spaces that you have found and find to be places of solidarity as a way of thinking of, about how we, how we move forward. Does anyone have it? Uh, well, um, I've been, uh, I mean, my work is about connecting with people and talking to different people and, and just uh, uh, and just doing the collaboration and things together. So I've been talking to curators, to I've been in conversation with a lot of people, and I and uh, and 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 I've engaged in in many in many projects, and I, I gave support to a lot of artists, and 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 i and i've received support but then it's there is support there there is uh, engagement there is the solidarity it's just uh, very fragmented it's just not connected and uh, when i'm talking about um, a, the ability of creating a network i mean may, men do it so brilliantly and secretly secretive secretly <laughs> and secretly and they're brilliant for that so i mean uh, there, there there are incredible women um, so committed to what they do, but it's just uh, they're not connected, and it's establishing this connection, establishing a relationship, and uh, and uh, and continuing these conversations um, and making things happen. Um, but collaboration is very powerful. I would do collaboration. I'm doing collaboration. What in my small world, uh, and I'm trying to make it as as uh, powerful and as uh, you know in um, intense as possible. Uh, and I see the power. It's more than a sum of its part. When you are connecting two incredible uh, women, professional, uh, they, I mean, they, they, what they can come out, two, 10, 20, it's amazing. So I would say that is, uh, is it's key. I, 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 in a way, I wanted to thank you, Ranjani, for uh, Ranjani for the, the the question because I think part of part of my response to that is that we're in a completely new kind of economic and political and cultural space to what we were experiencing 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And and actually, it's quite indicative in terms of who is on this panel and the kinds of work that's happening now. I mean, much of the work that was, might have been talked about in terms of a, a kind of radical politics was happening in independence and public public sphere. And the public sphere has shrunk to almost, uh, uh, to nil almost. And so we are in a very, very different kind of uh, uh, cultural space now and how we, how we try and think that through, whether one's talking about commercial galleries, whether one's talking about working with collectors, whether one's talking at, at a variety of, of, of different professional levels, things have changed and how do we, re how do we work with that new scenario? Which is which is very different to some of the models that we've that have come up in our discussions. 
You know, we can't look to the 70s or the 80s uh, for how we deal with what the situation that we're in now. I don't have an answer, but I, I can recognise that there, 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 the landscape's changed. I th I've just uh, one example of solidarity I'd like to point to is, is the, the image up there, which is um, speaking of Imelda, which is... Um, Imelda is Ireland making... What's that say? Ireland making... Destination for abortion, which is a sort of coming together of artists and activists uh, around um, the Irish um, antiquated um, abortion laws, and they're having a really powerful impact. I mean, one thing that strikes me, though, is that um, we've mainly been talking about networks or sort of quite um, physically insubstantial things. So, you know, things that aren't grounded in spaces, you know, places that we, buildings that we might own, basically. And um, I just wonder kind of how we maintain those things and why are we choosing to work in networks rather than spaces or are they just like not available to us? You know, and, and if we do choose to work in networks rather than spaces, what happens to all the kind of material things, you know? the artworks themselves, the people, and, um, and how do we support ourselves physically? <laughs> like, you know, and these are all sort of really big questions that I'm quite sure you won't be able to respond to, but if you had any reflect, because, uh, you yeah, know, I'm not sure if I'm, I just, I'm getting what you're saying, that you're talking about fundings. So, uh, for instance. Sustainability of, of this yeah, you know, so network Why building? not open a big museum or a big, gallery or a big archive why why go for a network that sort well, of well this is the beginning i mean it, it, you don't go from zero to 100 you know i think i think you just go scale by scale i mean you have to be ambitious for what you want to achieve but i think it's the beginning is really uh to build i mean in my in my own life as a collector i build i think i build a network of support that is immense and it took me 20 years and and then it's ongoing and so it doesn't take a day but i think it's just it's so core to what everybody we're not in the world alone i mean uh it's so core to have the support and to and to have a community that supports you and i think this is the the, the, the first step and then you will build a museum you will build i mean 10 museums i don't know in the future but i think it's uh, to build this uh, this network and this support system and dialogue commu open communication uh it's it's key um back to this idea about network i mean just a simple strategy that we try and embrace a bit at the gallery is that um you know, we quite often do curated shows, which is a way to kind of circulate more artists than we represent. And we probably do about two or three of those every year and a half. Um, and we host events and stage performances and things that have absolutely no commercial interest, you know, in terms of, of, of our kind of economy. But actually, the things that are really important to us um, and to, to the discourse. And um, I think that, you know, they're... They're things that we should all sort of... Um, they're moments where communities come together. You know, we held a talk at the gallery on Saturday and it was full of people that were interested to hear two people speak about the current exhibition. And I think it was a very simple strategy, but actually it's very effective um, to get 45 women in the room together. I think the question about institutions and spaces is, is a really interesting one and incredibly complex. And so possibly here is not the, the time or the place to sort of to go into that. But I do think it sort of raises questions of um, cultural values and cultural kind of hierarchies mm. that you see that, that you would sort of perceive the bricks and mortar of an institution having more sort of cultural value than, than possibly some, something else. Um, and I guess there's also sort of arguments about, you know, of a, a museum of women's art would sort of... Um, perpetuate the sort of ghettoisation or exclusion of women's art from sort of, sort of um, from wider cultural discourses as 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 well. Um, certainly within performance, um, all of the sort of um, all of the initiatives that are led by women were set up by those women. Which I mean. Actually, one of the things that I'm I kind of dream about in relation to the devotional project is that I build a museum for the work. I don't have any money, but that's what I'd love to do, you know. I can't think, why not stream that? 
Yeah, I totally have that dream too. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question? So I was um, here at the ICA uh, earlier in the year when there was this event uh, chaired by Hito Stale called FOMO. And one of the um, presentations was from this group called Women Inc., which was a group of sort of artists and curators. And they have this thing they called a sort of feminist lexicon, I think that's what they called it, which is a sort of playful language for thinking about the sort of gender politics in the art world. And under B, one of the categories was, was what they call a bontaku which is a gallery coup where they just, the gallery rescues just, um, an artist just after they've died or when they're about to die and then makes a killing on their estate. So we're talking in rather positive terms about these processes of recuperation and revaluing, but I think there is a, um, there is a kind of side of it, of the market, which operates in ways that we can perhaps be more critical about whereby living artists often can't make a living, but artists who've recently died or, um, yeah, their estates are being handled by some of the, the very dominant commercial galleries are making a killing. And I just wondered if we could perhaps reflect on that. That certainly happened um, uh, in relation to the AIDS pandemic, didn't it? Um, the people who actively went out as soon as they heard an artist was um, ill, they actively went out and bought their bought their work because they knew it would increase um, increase in value. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really big problem, especially when it um, relates to the kind of um, collection of archival material and the transformation of that material into objects for sale, which I think is um, often. Uh, a shifting boundary in relation to women's work, quite frankly, and um, yeah. So I, I have yeah, lots on that, I could say. On that point, I was a bit disturbed by the exhibition that circulated a few years ago of, um, as it were, remnants from Eva Hesse's studio. It was a very beautiful exhibition. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I can't remember who circulated it, I won't libelize myself. <laughs> but um, it was so aestheticized and they, and exactly as you're describing, Amy, these things that were not finished works, they were literally things that had been retrieved, presumably from her studio when she died, yeah. were then presented as if they were finished um, objects. Although I guess the, that exhibition, in, in one sense, studio works, it was at the Fruit Market Gallery in, in Edinburgh, and um, at least those objects were all in the collection of, uh, I think, Philadelphia, I'm not sure, museum. Um, so in a sense that that exhibition was there to kind of destabilize like a kind of category of finished artwork. Um, but unfortunately, that feminist gesture, feminist art historical gesture, does in a way seem to have opened the gate towards, you know, framing certain things that wouldn't normally be framed and putting them on a gallery wall and selling them for more money. Um, but <laughs> I'm just going to comment really briefly yeah. about that. Um, I think those kinds of statements are actually really unhelpful because um, the diversity of different approaches to artist estates is as wide as there is the number of kind of performance artists. So, of course, there are people that mismanage estates and do horrendous things with them and oversell them and do not take care of the art historical position of the artwork. Um, or the artist's wishes or the artist's families. But there are also lots of estates which are very carefully looked after and actually where the, the role of the gallerist is often to maintain that legacy by doing a lot of work which would actually be considered um, archival work and curatorial work and, in fact, kind of getting critics involved. Um, so I think... It's, it's very easy to, to dismiss and, you know, we, we read the horror stories in the artist newspaper or you see something at an art fair that sort of calls into question, but there are lots of um, people doing really good work that institutions can't afford to do and that archives can't afford to do and lots of artists that would not be here and not be known about are there because of, of the work of at the hand of private individuals. So 
Um, and that Eva Hess exhibition, I mean, I know, in fact, the, the guy who runs Eva Hess estate and, and he's in continual conversation with her sister that's still alive. So there is a kind of dialogue about, you know, what happens to her work. So that's... I think that's one of the things that the um, Monica Ross Action Group is also, also because Monica I mean, uh, was just a huge influence on everybody and everything, really. Um, and so much about Monica's work was Monica being in the work, Monica being the work, and it's sort of what happens to to that now. Now that Monica's no longer here, how do you how do you keep that work alive? Um, and um, how do you sort of draw together all of the sort of different aspects of the work in the way that Monica did this just through her embodiment of it? And I think it's one of the challenges that the, that the action groups kind of really addressing in, re in really interesting ways, in really interesting ways. And yeah, because that group is sort of friends and colleagues, people who worked with Monica and really knew her practice and worked with her. And, and I think, yeah, it's a really good example of, of trying to sort of enliven a work, keep it active and, and actually introduce like lots more people to it and, and recirculate it in different ways. And it really feels like a kind of feminist strategy or, you know, and a really successful and kind of, you know, almost like viral or something. Um, energy that circulates through that project. So, I mean, that's one way I think I'd hope that we could, if we are gonna rescue women artists, we'd do it that way. Um, but I think, do we have time? No? Okay, we're, we're at time. Um, but I wanted to just say a really big thank you to our speakers once again, if we could. <laughs> And also to everyone at the ICA, and I think we'll also be sort of heading for a drink in the bar if anyone would like to join us. But thank you all for coming. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> and Helena.